The Sunshine State is known for many things. Oranges, beaches, sunshine, but also great professional wrestling, as it was home to one legendary promotion that changed the entire industry for the better. Not only did it feature some tremendous talents like Dusty Rhodes, Boris Malenko's, The Funks, The Briscoes, and of course The Grams, but it also showed us just how great cross-promotion can really be. So what is this promotion? How can it be so great? Well, that's the subject of this video, because this is the history of championship wrestling from Florida. Thank you to Cool Ass Jack and Inigo Montoya and all of my other Patreon supporters for all the help during these times. Before we get into the episode, allow me to ask that you make sure that you're a member of the Know It All Nation, because every subscriber helps me to get to my goal of getting that silver play button, which I feel like I'm way overdue for. And also, if you'd like to further support this channel, please go over and sign up on my Patreon page, as every little bit helps and you also get your shout out as well as access to bonus material and you get to vote on the Patreon polls, because you should have a say on what goes on in this channel. Anyway, with all this being said, now, let's get into the video. Founded by the retired heel wrestler Cowboy Clarence Preston Luttrell, whose biggest claim to fame up until that point was competing in a boxing match against Jack Dempsey. Although competing might be putting it nicely. Anyway, nine years after that bout and Cowboy Luttrell would open the Tampa, Florida wrestling office, which would soon become a member of the National Wrestling Alliance. In that same year, the state had just been hit by what was known simply as the Florida Hurricane or the Delray Beach Hurricane, which caused around $50 million in damage. So, needless to say, this was an interesting time to start a business. However, Luttrell wasn't the sole owner of the promotion, as others were able to buy into it, like in 1961, when the promotion's best-known owner, Luttrell's own protege, Eddie Graham, officially bought into the company before completely taking it over after Clarence had to step away a decade later in 1971. Now, Graham was born in 1930 in Dayton, Tennessee, and from birth he was only able to see out of one eye, but even with that, he had had to sell eggs and newspapers as a child, coming from a troubled home life. Although there was an upside, because the newspaper that he worked for offered a YMCA gym membership to the Newsies, where he began developing his training in physical fitness. Then, at the age of 17, he would begin wrestling after being trained by none other than Cowboy Luttrell himself. From there, Graham started out as an occasional kayfabe kin to Nature Boy Buddy Rogers named Rip Rogers, and no, not that Rip Rogers. From there, in 1958, after a loser leaves Texas Texas match, he ended up changing his name to Eddie Graham. But now, instead of being Buddy Rogers' brother, he became a fictional family member to Dr. Jerry and Crazy Luke Graham, and eventually would be later on joined by that of Superstar Billy. Anyway, the Graham brothers did fairly well for themselves in Capital Wrestling, the company now known as WWE. But we'll be getting more into them in just a little bit. Anyway, back to the matter at hand. In 1960, Eddie would leave his kayfabe kin in order to start wrestling in Florida. He would continue to wrestle there for a bit, even after after completely taking over the CWF in 1971. He would eventually retire in 1977, only to return the following year. He would for real real retire in 1982. Oh, and I would also like to bring up that with his troubles as a young man and with the YMCA membership being a very important part of his life, Eddie Graham knew just how important it was to give young people a place to go that will give them some direction. And together, Eddie Graham and Cowboy Luttrell would found the Florida Boys and Girls Ranch Villa, with every CWF show donating to the cause with Gran paying it forward for all the help that he received as a kid. Returning to talking about the promotion, Championship Wrestling from Florida would call 106 North Albany Lane in Tampa home, as that was the location for their 7,500 square foot building that they called the Tampa Sportatorium, which was used on Thursdays at 11 a.m. for TV tapings that would air the following Sunday. Now, this was not a large arena by any stretch, as it allegedly held less than 100 people, and it had no air conditioning even though it was in Florida. But in order to make it appear larger, the room had all black walls, and upstairs, there was the actual office for the Tampa Wrestling Office, where Eddie and his son Mike, along with Jim Barnett, would get all their office work done. Not only that, but there was also an on-site gym there as well. But while the building itself was small, it made up for it with the size of its wrestling and its stars, because during the good years under Graham, who himself would even get to serve two terms as NWA president, the company did extremely well, succeeding off of several strategies, not all of which were conventional for the time. One such tactic was the use of interpromotion, because while the show was immensely popular and did very well in its home state, it also did well in the New York market too, airing on a Spanish language channel in the area. Furthermore, Graham was also 
also friends with Vince McMahon Sr., which opened the doors for a lot of talent exchanges and co-branded shows, such as the Super Bowl of Wrestling, which took place on January 25th, 1978, from the Orange Bowl Arena. Also, before this event actually happened, it was named in the movie The Wrestler, the 1970s one, not the Mickey Rourke one. This show featured the WWF stars taking on the stars from the CWF, with the main event featuring WWF World Champion Superstar Billy Graham going against NWA World Champion Harley Race. And the show did quite well, because with Championship Wrestling from Florida, presentation was everything. Not only was Championship Wrestling from Florida known for its great in-ring work, but it was also known for just how well they presented all of it, as the company was known just as much for its wrestling as it was for its star power. In the beginning, the CWF had a lot of success with the likes of Luthez and Gene Kaniski, not to mention Eddie Graham himself along with his work with Sam Steamboat. And while there was also plenty of other stars in the promotion, too many to name, we do absolutely just have to bring up the vocal stylings of the legendary commentator and star in his own right, Gordon Soley. However, as time went on, a new star would emerge, who would become the face of the franchise. And of course, this man was none other than the American dream, Dusty Rhodes. However, Rhodes actually started off as a heel. It wasn't until the mid-70s when Pac Song and manager Gary Hart turned on Dusty during a match with Eddie and Mike Graham that the American dream would turn babyface. He would then become a working class hero and a solo star, resonating with fans and becoming more over than anybody ever thought possible. He was so over in fact that Graham would occasionally have him leave the promotion to work elsewhere, like for Vince Sr., just so someone else had a chance of getting over in the CWF. But of course, Dusty's fame worked to get others over too, mainly heels, as many a bad guy or would-be heel would seek out working with Rhodes just in order to make a name for themselves. That's right, the American dream was so popular that there were wrestlers who were willing to turn heel just because they would get more over Breaking Bad on Dusty than they ever could being a face on their own. And one such talent would wind up becoming Dusty's greatest rival. Of course, I'm talking about the nature boy Ric Flair, who originally wanted to be a carbon copy of Dusty, that is, until Dusty told him to find his own way and be his own man. To which Flair took that to mean, just rip off Buddy Rogers instead. But hey, it worked. These were the golden years for championship wrestling from Florida, at least for a while. But things wouldn't stay solvent forever. Despite the popularity that the wrestling was receiving, the company was facing financial hardship, leading to Eddie Graham succumbing to a combination of both his business and personal issues in 1985, much of which had to do with concerns outside of that of pro wrestling. The company was left in the hands of other owners, primarily Hiro Matsuda and Duke Kiyomuka, but this changeover did not do any favors for the company, as just two years later, Jim Crockett Promotions would acquire them in February of 1987, with many of the top acts already working for them, or more likely, working for Vince McMahon Jr. The Graham sold the Sportatorium just a few years later, and it would become a textile factory for years, until it was auctioned off in 2016. It would be purchased in 2020 by a developmental group. Things for the Graham family would only get worse, but there were still some positives left for the company that used to be known as Championship Wrestling from Florida. In 2003, a revival was created that served as part of the NWA before leaving in 2012, when it continued as an independent promotion. Furthermore, in 2006, the tape library would be purchased by WWE for use in their Dusty Rhodes DVD collection. The following June, a promotion modeled after the CWF called Florida Championship Wrestling was created that quickly replaced Deep South Wrestling as the second developmental territory for WWE. By 2008, it had become the only developmental promotion for World Wrestling Entertainment. FCW became the proving ground for such talents such as Daniel Bryan, Bray Wyatt, Dean Ambrose, Roman Reigns, Seth Rollins, and many many more. And then in 2012, FCW would be rebranded to the name it's now known by today, NXT. Well, there you go, the history of championship wrestling from Florida. What are some of your favorite CWF moments? Let me know down in the comments and please make sure that you're a member of the Know It All Nation and that you give this video a big like. Thank you so much for watching and thank you to all my awesome Patreon supporters out there. And as always, Dave knows.